Sure. Hello, everybody. A very good yeah. evening. I'm Richa Agarwal, CEO of Imami Art and Kolkata Center for Creativity. And like you've been hearing our green room banter for a while now, we've been very excited about curating the entire uh, series of talks and mentorship programs. And we're coming up very soon with uh, a new genre of work that we plan, which we'll announce. So there's been a lot of energy, a lot of positivity, lots of learning and lots of time to ingest what you're hearing and learning and relive those moments because that's what is most important to be able to give time to what you hear because that's when we grow. So I'd like to thank Santosh for being a part of our conversation series today and helping us with spreading the message of positive energies and not any other energies. And uh, thank you, Ushmita, for curating uh, the entire, uh, up to the third series till now and waiting for the entire year to roll out. Oh. I'd like to introduce uh, TV Santosh, though he doesn't need much, but this is more for myself. I'm going to go ahead and do it. So TV Santosh studied painting from the Trichur Institute of Fine Arts and studied sculpture at Shantiniketan and MS University, Baroda, India. Amongst numerous exhibitions, the artist's work has shown at Kochi Muzaris Biennale 2016, The Great Game, Iran National Pavilion, Venice Biennale 2015, Making History, Colombo Art Biennale 2014, Havana Biennale 2012, Rewriting Worlds, curated by Peter Wibble, 14th Moscow Biennale of Contemporary Art 2011. Crossroads, India Escalate, Prague Biennale 5, 2011. Empire Strikes Back at Saatchi Gallery, London, 2010. Vancouver Biennale, Dark Materials at the Royal Academy of Arts, London, Blood and Spit, solo show by Jackson Gallery in collaboration with the Guild Art Gallery in 2005, Unresolved Stories with Nature Mod Delhi in collaboration with the Guild Art Gallery, Mumbai, One Hand Clapping Siren, Jahangir Art Gallery, Mumbai, presented by the Guild Art Gallery. I can go on and on talking about Santosh's achievements as an artist, but I'd love to talk about him being an inspiring mentor for so many youngsters who have seen his work, who have learned, who have adapted from his style, probably created a little more, uh, created their own style after seeing his. So thank you, Santosh, for being with us today. And I hand the evening over to you now. Thank you, Richa. Um, thank you, Santosh. It's a, it's a real pleasure uh, having you here uh, for our Nirmami Art Conversations. We've had many conversations, uh, you know, these past years about your work. Uh, I distinctly remember one that we had a, a long conversation that we had uh, in Shantiniketan a few years back. So we hope, I hope, uh, you know, we can discuss about your practice and many people who are watching may be inspired by uh, your vision, your trials and tribulations and how you look at life uh, as such. So before uh, we go into uh, the session, I'd like to remind all our viewers, I'd like to first welcome all our viewers here on Zoom as well as on Facebook. Uh, and I would like to tell you that please do write in your questions, uh, even on Facebook, do write in and we will try and accommodate as many as possible towards the end of uh, our conversation. Um, so Santosh, uh, before I start sharing your uh, images and works, uh, you studied in Trishur and then you came to Shantiniketan, you studied as a sculptor and then going on uh, to Baroda to do your master's degree. So can you tell us a little, uh, a kind of a very brief background to, uh, to your life as an artist uh, during your early years? Yeah, as you said, uh that I had uh, studied uh, painting in Trishu, my hometown in Kerala. So no, it was one of the very small institute that time when I was studying there. 
Uh, one of the very old uh, art institute in Kerala, probably almost more than 100 years, because it, this institute was established during the British time. But there's still uh, the kind of curriculum and the methodology of teaching was quite uh, old, you know, the kind of a British academic system that we used to follow. Uh, so I studied painting there. So uh, learned a little bit about the technicalities of painting, how to handle the medium and things like that. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing was that uh, it was during the 80s, almost uh, the middle of the 80s. Um, culturally very active period in Kerala actually. A lot of things were happening. So I learned a lot of things from that institute, especially from a, one of the teacher there. And also I learned a lot of things outside the college actually. You were very was, politically involved, if I'm not mistaken. You were, uh, you know, you, you were quite political right from uh, those uh, days. You used to make posters and go out into uh, protests. Yeah, that uh, it was quite accidental, in fact, because uh, there was one organization in Kerala during that time, especially in Trichur. It's called Pradigarna Sangam, one of the kind of uh, reactionary uh, platform. And they uh, had a, uh, also published one magazine. So the, the editor of that magazine had uh, come to me for various reasons, maybe for illustration or making posters and things like that. So gradually I found myself being part of the whole you know, organization. It was a kind of an eclectic uh, organization with a uh, uh, lot of people in it, actually. Because there were people from Gandhian background, and there were people from the next uh, late movement. Mm -hmm. All kind of uh, people from different political viewpoint were there. But so how was Shanti? They were my, so this, uh, you know, whatever I had learned uh, during that period, actually, you know, in terms of the, my involvement with the kind of political activities, which is there, and also the kind of technical understanding of painting and so on. So when I came to Shandinike, then, I realized that I had to relearn everything that I had learned already. Mm -hmm. uh, because I joined uh, in Shandinike then again from the very basics. You know, for example, yeah. I started from the very beginning. Bachelors. I could have uh, probably, because since the institute where I studied, it did not have a kind of mark list and it was not nationally recognized, mm -hmm. I could not. Uh, study for a you know, post graduation there in India. Yeah. For example, post diploma, you can only apply for maximum post diploma, right. which was not possible because of these technical issues. Mm -hmm. So I had to study from the very beginning. Right. So it was a wonderful law for me to uh, re understand, check myself, whatever I had learned is really right or not. So it was a kind of a relearning and unlearning process that was there in China, right. especially in the initial days. Actually. And from there you went to Baroda and uh, you also did your post-graduation in sculpture. Uh, so maybe I can now share the screen because the first very first images that we see are from uh, your uh, practice in Baroda. Just a second. Yeah. Yeah. So, so these are uh, a couple of works. Yeah, that the, the previous one, previous one. Uh, just check the other one because I did this work in Canary Arts Center. Almost same time, the year is same. Okay. 
Mm. I don't know where it has gone. It's some, I'm sorry, my, yeah, just a second. Yeah, this one. Because this was my MFA final year work. Mm -hmm. uh, I have few more work uh, images, but uh, most of the works I had done during that period is almost destroyed because mm -hmm. there was no space to keep it since it was quite a large scale. Right. And uh, this is one of the final year work that I had done. Is this, okay. is yeah. this also from your final year? Uh, no, it's so. It's I, I did this work soon after uh, I passed out from Baroda. This was done in Kanuri Art Center. Mm -hmm. Same place, same year actually. Soon after the exit. And this was in Kanoria. See, this was also, also in Kanuri. So in a in a way, uh, you know, after passing out or completing your uh, post graduation, you were uh, involved in doing sculpture, uh, but then you gradually moved towards painting, uh, returning to sculpture again much mm -hmm. later in 2005. And also presently, uh, your practice involves both painting and sculptures. Yeah. So uh, if we return back to this early time, uh, you know, so can you can you tell us a little about this movement from uh, sculpture into painting? Was it something easy or did it help you to approach painting in a different uh, uh, manner? Uh, what what was your process of thinking? Yeah, it was a little com complicated to say uh, where did it all started. Mm. Because even I would say that uh, originally I was a painter because I studied there in Kerala mm. painting. So then when I came to Shandinigya, then I started uh, specializing in sculpture. Since I thought that sculpture is quite refreshing for me during that, especially during that particular time. And also there was a kind of a belief that uh, you know, there is more possibility uh, to explore in sculpture linguistically. Mm -hmm. More than in painting, it's kind of an uh, probably a wrong idea, but uh, that was a kind of a prevailing idea during that time because there were very interesting things in sculpture happening in sculpture, oh. happening. Mm. especially the kind of artists who came from Kerala, like Rinsen, Lex Matthew, and all that. And I was so inspired by their works and. Uh, I thought that probably the sculpture had a lot more possibilities. That's why one of the reasons I took sculpture is specialization. But uh, even uh, when I was in Baroda doing MFA in specialization in sculpture, I realized that I am not really uh, fit for being a sculptor because I found that there are a lot of uh, issues regarding the technicalities. Mainly because, you know, when you imagine something and in order to execute that idea, the sculpture, it involves so many uh, issues in terms of uh, material, medium, and uh, from all other technicalities, you know. Even in terms of the scale also, a very big issue, especially in the Okay, so sculpture scale is one of the really important aspect of sculpture. So, yeah. So it was a kind of a, a, a very complicated issue, which I couldn't solve during that period when I came to Bombay. Because in Bombay, to have a sculpture studio was not very easy during that time. So I started painting. Mm -hmm. Then when I was able to have a studio for sculpture, then I thought, okay, I can start sculpture again. And that is how the whole thing happened. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, so these early paintings, you know, like metabolism test, and we'll see a few more images, mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, your land, my laboratory, um, siren, 
and history still repeats itself so these are kind of uh, you know your early works uh, which are underlined by you know a, an approach that is quite uh, multiple in how you take images from the mediated reality and from films uh, especially uh, you know you've taken images from bergman's uh, seventh seal uh, or uh, in this uh, you have been inspired uh, by Holbein's uh, painting of the two ambassadors. So how do you renegotiate, you know, how do these various threads of um, media images, films, uh, historical um, imagery, as well as, I think, underlying current uh, political uh, kind of uh, 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 looking at the world, how does all this come together within these particular works? Yeah, actually, to, uh, frankly speaking, there are several phases of stylistic uh, development that have happened even before. Mm -hmm. The kind of works that you see right now. Uh, this is one of the stage, probably I started exhibiting my works in Bombay. So, and uh, these are the, probably the kind of works I have documented. So there are many works. Uh, I have in the document that I don't have in this. But uh, one of the thing uh, is that I used to like one of the writer in Kerala, his name is Anand. He's a writer of par excellence. He writes novels. He's also a thinker. Most of his uh, writings, when you read, it, on the, it has got many layer, layers, actually. On the one hand, you will feel that it's just a reportage, news reportage. And then as the story progress, you realize that it's not uh, something that you have initially thought, and uh, slowly you see that a kind of a story develops. And there is a history in those stories. There is mythology in story. It is, uh, sometimes it is very difficult to differentiate between the history and the mythology. You, know, you cannot make a clear uh, cut uh, differentiation between the history and the mythology. Where does the history start and where does the mythology start? You know, that kind of a, kind of a language where multiple viewpoints were fused, in, fused together. Right. So that was one of the uh, kind of a linguistic concern that I was trying to do with my painting in those period. But I, during that period, I was looking at a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Second World War photographies. You know. And I was I, asking. I think, yeah, like this, I think, is from one of the concentration camp for children, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, one direct uh, photographical reference that I have taken. Uh, so in this, uh, in, in this time, kind of, uh, period of work, uh, where the language is quite, uh, you know, almost hyper-realistic, and you are juxtaposing different uh, images together. For instance, here you have the image of the uh, concentration camp and uh, where you've also made halos. And then you have on the left uh, the image of a bee. So how, how does juxtaposition within your work, uh, what does it mean? And how do you, uh, what do you say uh, by this kind of uh, bringing images from different uh, time, places uh, together? Uh, you know, it's a kind of uh, uh, my works works in different levels. Actually, there are uh, different ways you can approach the work. Uh, this is one of the stage where I have started juxtaposing kind of a contrasting, seemingly contrasting imageries. You know, but still, probably they have uh, some kind of underlying connections or some kind of a correlation between them. 
and each uh, reference which i had taken have a, some kind of a historical you know, significance for example this photograph i had taken from the world war period so one of the moment very important historical moment when this this inmates in the concentration camp were actually listening or hearing that uh, the veil war is all over you know, and uh, this is one of the very rare photographs which all these inmates were trying to celebrate you know, the, uh, the victory over the kind of uh, war that had happened mm. or the kind of war that had been troubling or uh, making their life miserable yeah. so this i was thinking them as a kind of a characters who had a going to kind of a trouble in time mm -hmm. very specific or particular story maybe and uh, they were it's almost like a uh, you know, kind of people probably had a kind of certain amount of a divinity in them so that they could survive It's such a yeah. terrible time of that particular period. So I sort of superimposed this element of uh, halos around them. Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, it's on the left side. It's a kind of an image which you can see in nature. Where when you talk about or think about the kind of uh, the community of bees and how they work together as a society a close to society where uh, right. everything is you know depending on the kind of work they do and uh, the kind of, uh, right. uh, the connection with uh, the, the kind of innate uh, quality that they have and also so honey how, honey has i think also been linked to the idea of healing it's also medicinal so in a way uh, that kind of a reading uh, can also probably yes yes yeah all those uh, connections are there actually because each image seems to have a kind of multi layered meaning you know? right so moving on i mean from there we kind of move forward to a set of works uh, where i think uh, a lot of people would be familiar with uh, these works uh, where uh, again you are using media images uh, from all over the world but in a very particular uh, you're using this solarization of colors uh, which almost recall thermal imaging technology and uh, you know uh, you in this i think you are talking a lot about war and terrorism but uh, the interesting part i think is where the image can be from any place and you then subvert it you then change it uh, through this manipulation of color so could you tell us uh, a little more about this yeah. actually I, i have to say a little bit about the kind of uh, what i have been doing before this phase the kind of that monochromatic uh, black and white period you know, sort of uh, what you call as uh, hyper realist period mm -hmm. we have been basically looking at uh, second world war photography you know, and uh, trying to ask uh, questions uh, like uh, i used to say that it's kind of an eternal question which you can ask at any point of time in the history for any kind of time in the human life and still it would be relevant for example questions like uh, who is the real enemy and why at all there is war happening all around and where, why there are enmities between two neighboring countries and such uh, uh, questions you can ask at any point of time and still it will be relevant so when i was looking at the second world war black and white photography i realized that this questions are kind of questions 
even very relevant today you know especially uh, if you go back uh, to the painting metabolism test before uh, i had taken an image uh, from uh, bergman's 7c actually bergman also had done this movie during uh, 1952 soon after the second world war he was also thinking about almost similar similar things he was wondering why at all there are a lot of death happening around and uh, he wanted to ask a similar kind of questions through his movie so that the death the image of death become a kind of an interesting mm-hmm. you know, image or even the character itself in, in this uh, movie even that becomes a kind of personified image so i thought that i can use that and try to reinterpret in my own way thinking that uh, you know there are certain aspects in one could uh, you know uh, focus little more better in the sense uh, with the bergman's movie the reason for that is a kind of a natural calamity which is plague that happened uh, during the medieval period mm-hmm. he took back the whole story back to the medieval period and uh, narrated the whole story mm-hmm. in the background of uh, plague that is happening yeah. he didn't directly mention or conceive the whole idea that uh, that the kind of death that is happening is due to the war or the kind of death that is happening because there is a human error that is there right. so i thought probably one can probably bring it back and reinterpret the whole movie mm-hmm. to a completely different perspective that's why i used uh, you know in the foreground you can see a kind of a rat lab tree there are a lot of uh, experiments happening and the whole incidence of uh, the protagonist uh, playing chess with the you know uh, the personified uh, form of it mm. uh, and uh, in the background the kind of image that you see in is a kind of nuclear explosion image it's slightly distorted and uh, stretched horizontally mm. so this here the background in the movie the background is a kind of a natural calamity and it's uh, which is play but in my painting i try to put it slightly differently saying that the background of the kind of that is that that is happening today is not uh, something very natural but it's there is a human hand in it mm. well, human I, intervention is there actually i think i mentioned this to you when i saw the images that you shared that this work seems very relevant right now as does bergman's movie and your whole idea about uh, you, you know death and calamities which would be man made or which could be natural so this this kind of thing that uh, makes it quite relevant in today's uh, condition of things going uh, you know forward to the other works that we kind of went back from so here uh, do talk a little bit about how the technique of solarization came on and how you uh, then used it to underline uh the you know how a calamity can happen in a certain area but then it also can become universal in in nature you know, when these are especially man made uh, wars and calamities yeah so in continuation of what i have said already uh even talking about the kind of eternal questions which you can keep on ask uh, at any point of time and still it will be relevant mm. so i realized that when you ask such questions today 
problem seems to be almost same people are having changed you know people probably haven't learned anything from what have happened in the history people never seems to understand you know or learn anything from history you know that was one of the kind of a revelation that i got uh so when i was looking at the second world war photography i thought that probably i can look at the kind of war that is happening during our time so i realized that even the uh, kind of news report images that you see on every day basis is very important and uh, it also talk about similar things so there are certain aspects in the sense every day every day you get up in the morning and look at the newspaper see so many kind of war that is happening so many kind of deaths that is happening around. and uh, one can understand that uh, such news report images or even the kind of news is the kind of information that is being projected at us by the media can sort of uh, uh, reshape or formulate our understanding of what is reality. Right. It is uh, main thing. So I was basically looking at uh, the, especially the TV news report page. When the same news that ha- happened somewhere in the Middle East is being reported by two different channels differently because of the political differences. That was one of the uh, important aspects that struck me during that period. So I realized that the media have the potential to reshape or even manipulate our understanding of reality. And we even develop uh, what is, we even develop the kind of understanding of what is happening today, it's solely based on the imagery, so the information put forward by the media, news media. So it is very difficult to know what is actually happening out there. in this world you know because we don't have the first hand experience whatever the experience that we get or even the information that we get is always filtered through a, a kind of a politically manipulated uh, you know systems or channels so my way my understanding was that uh, why don't i pick up uh, this issue and uh, at this point of so that's why I started picking up the very current uh, imagery that on an everyday basis we throw at this. So that's why I even started taking images from various sources, maybe from news papers or even from uh, news report uh, portals, online portals and things like that. So I picked up certain images from the media, mm. uh, thinking that those images have the potentiality to uh, cut across the territories and uh, the possibilities to become a universal image where anyone from any part of the world can identify with that. So that is... This is the basic uh, kind of a fundamental philosophy behind the selection of those images. But technically speaking, this in terms of the language that I have been using, especially this uh, talking about the solarization of images, mm-hmm. you know, uh, this was uh, during that particular time I started using computers and. Uh, I have been using the computer in order to store or document images uh, that has given various you know, medias or news report uh, 
focus and things like that. Uh, I just played around with the various softwares in the computer and one, one day I realized that when you turn a positive image into negative, a lot of things happen, a lot of very interesting things there happen. Uh, when you simply look at the negative, you cannot uh, make out where exactly it is happening. Certain specific cities of location and territories becomes, you know, subdued or uh, obscured in that image. Uh, this thing happened with one of the images when I was working with. You know, right. It was an image of an uh, American street protest image. Uh, I had a uh, you know, sort of uh, turned that image into a negative and I saw that uh, by simply looking at that negative, you cannot make out where it is actually happening. Because those local specific cities are being obscured. Yeah. And anybody from the any part of the world can identify with that image as something that happened that is happening next to their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I realized that uh, uh, this turning positive into negative changes a lot of things, and uh, one of the thing that happens is that the negative becomes a kind of a universal limit. So that is one one of the aspects that I started listing negative. Then slowly you can see that uh, that language is developing. And, uh, For me, I whenever I looked at you know this these kind of series where there is such a uh, solarization of the Im uh, you know color and it always reminds me of these you know thermal imaging technology. It kind of tinges your paintings with this idea of fear and danger and a and an unknown predator. Uh, so I think that is something that has always stuck me, that this, this kind of coloring, yeah. in that uh, inherent danger out. And uh, Santosh, uh, moving on, I think, uh, keeping in mind the time that we have, I think, uh, if you don't mind, I can move on to some of your sculptures works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, coming to, uh, this particular work from 2007, I found it very interesting. Um, I'm just going to, for a second, uh, share the other work from your Baroda uh, days. And both of these works, which are separated by almost a decade, are called Thus He Disclosed the Secret of Destiny II. Uh, but the language changes. Uh, when you return back to sculpture, the way you approach it, I think, has changed. And uh, uh, in many of your sculptures, by adding this element of time and text, you, you then make those uh, particular emotions or particular events quite universal. So could you talk to us a little bit about uh, these sculptures and how you utilize text within these? Yeah. Yeah. So many issues that probably I can talk about. One thing, why I had used the same, same uh, title for yeah, you know, sure. two works, which uh, uh, done in two different times, actually. One work I did during my MA period, and then yeah. study. Uh, well, probably so many things I can talk about. It, it has put uh, so many layers of uh, meaning. Even the, the very process of the work was completely different. For example, the first work I did it during the Baroda time. The work, the first actually title came into my mind. Normally when you do a work, uh, normally the image comes, some kind of a crude image comes, then from there you develop into a full-fledged work. But here, surprisingly, it's a very rare thing that happened even with me. First came the title, some, something like a kind of a, a spiritual revelation. Thing for me. Why, why such title came to my mind, I, I 
could not understand the initial stages. Mm -hmm. Probably there are many various things, uh, so the kind of books that I have been reading, mm -hmm. the kind of philosophies that I have been influenced, even the kind of uh, very personal approach uh, to the kind of realities in which we are living. All those probably might have uh, had uh, some some reasons behind yeah. that. There is this issue of uh, looking at uh, reality from a kind of pessimist's point of view. And that is one of the aspects probably connected with the first work I had. And, uh, the language is slightly different in the sense there are uh, uh, different types of uh, linguistic uh, system I have used in the first two. For example, the, the kind of uprooted tree. Uh, it have got uh, both ends. On the one side, you will see the kind of uh, uh, image which is uh, kind of a stylized variation of uh, mushroom cloud. On the other side, you will see kind of a branch that look like uh, roots. You know, and uh, kind of a Buddha-like figure sitting and contemplating that. And this figure is actually holding a wine glass and he's smiling. And this Buddha-like figure is actually looking beyond uh, or looking into the future, what may happen in the future. You know. So that this fear of something catastrophic thing might happen, something catastrophic too might happen, maybe in the form of a natural calamity was something that might happen due to a kind of human intervention, that I, one could read through this work actually. And I use this table, long table. Mm -hmm. uh, that table actually came from the Last Supper, Da Vinci's Last Supper. Mm -hmm. Because the Last Supper actually signified to me a kind of a moment where Christ actually tried to, you know, disclose certain things that may happen in the future within these three days of time. So you mm -hmm. talk about uh, like somebody is going to betray him, and he is going to get crucified, and things like that. So this. Uh, I took this aspect of a kind of a pessimistic prophecy that may happen in the future. And this idea actually probably is, probably that is one of the ideas that is a kind of a common uh, thread or a kind of element that connects both words together. Otherwise, they are completely different. Right. So this uh, idea of a pessimistic uh, prediction almost, you know, or uh, what you have mentioned some time back that uh, humanity doesn't seem to be learning uh, from its mistakes. Uh, so for instance, in, in this work, uh, the text uh, I think is very, very poignant. Um, if you could say a little bit about this. Yeah, this uh, text is actually, I, you know, I have been using uh, testimonies of uh, different people who have been a kind of a victim of circumstances, especially the war, mm -hmm. war and political circumstances. And this were, text actually had taken from uh, uh, you know, a victim of uh, Nazi regime during the you know, German Nazi period, Hitler's period actually. So this was, uh, I had taken the text from there, then I just uh, concised it and made it a uh, little more intense. This is one of the kind of, uh, you know, practice that used to happen in the concentration camp, something like, uh, you know, the doctors will come and make a cut in the body of the inmate. 
and they will let the wound to grow mm. rather than heal in order to see whether how far this human being or this patient can withstand the pain of the wound Uh, they use the human beings like a guinea pig in guinea the name pig, of science. Yeah. yeah. For example, there are, this uh, text says the testimony says that when, even you know maybe after one week or one month, when the wound is yet about to heal, mm. this the, the scientist or the doctor will come again and open the wound again. Mm. You know. so i thought that this is a very interesting uh, idea yeah, it becomes Concept a metaphor that it's a metaphor very strong yeah. metaphor even that you reflect over our own time also sometimes yeah exactly because the uh, problem never seems to heal yeah this this never seems to heal only thing is that we keep on even it is about heal we keep on digging it and opening the wound and make it fresh wound You know, or even when the wound is still alive, you know what uh, the solution, what the kind of political uh, or the kind of uh, people do is that just they just change that tension. You know, just uh, that is a kind of political strategy that you can see. being practiced even today they don't solve the issue but rather they just change the you know attention of uh, the issue okay. into something else and also uh, when you talk about cruelty i think this this work is also quite poignant in the sense that you talk about these dogs that were used in the world war 2 uh who were trained to blow up like bombs under the tanks of the allied forces um so um again you bring in these analogies and metaphors of war and humanity what it means to be human but do tell us i think uh this use of the timer is very very interesting um uh, how do you look at this as uh, humanity's time ticking or are these are we sitting on bombs that are about to explode what exactly does these timer do these timers mean to you because you have used it in many of your sculptures yeah this on the one hand it is it is a kind of a metaphorical image on the other hand you can see it as a literal you know time bomb device where you can see that uh, time is always ticking and it's in a count of counting down format so i was basically interested in this aspect of counting down format which uh, seems to have multiple correlations uh if you really because i think uh there are a lot of ways in which one can look at the kind of things that, that may happen in future you know and uh, the, uh, there is uh, one way of looking at future in the sense which on the one hand probably you can say it is a kind of very pessimistic way of looking at nature nature but there is a possibility that uh, there is a very dangerous calamities waiting for us i think i have been talking about that actually it mm-hmm. can be very natural kind of a calamity or can be something that might be happening due to a kind of human intervention some kind of a final doom that may be in the future right and if you are looking at from that point of view we are basically inching towards that future mm-hmm. counting so down our days you know right so it's also interesting that it's not just about the present you, you're kind of drawing this this line between the present the past and the future uh, and also especially in a work like uh, the threshold to a dream whose image you are seeing and where you made the victoria terminus i i think i asked you why you have kept it at an angle 
and you mentioned that it's almost like you're archiving for things that are there within the uh, within the uh, you know uh, below the ground almost as it were uh, historically speaking yeah so again a kind of metaphorical way of looking at the world normally when you look at the history in order to understand our past we do kind of an excavation process of excavating is actually digging the surface of earth and there can be so many layers of it so it is something very similar in order to understand the whole political history india especially during the colonial period and so on for that so in order to understand what have actually really happened with so many other uh, issues so one of the way is to dig what has you know something that have been already buried by the, the dust of the time but is the is the seer artist as as you are saying uh, you know uh, through your title of your work that you can almost look into the future so does the seer artist or the seer here uh, you know look at the past the present and the future and the is the, is the future then a pessimistic um, space is there no hope because for instance in this work you you have these numbers which are taken from 200 years of history uh, important events calamities mostly man made if i'm not wrong um so so is this the kind of uh, future that we may expect unless we change ourselves is that what uh, you as a artist seer kind of look at so basically it's a very simple logic that you look at uh, the future based on what we know about our past what were the lessons we have learned from the past mm. so all these works basically talk about very much similar issues especially this work mm. all this uh, the plates that uh, denote the the yeah. number of years you know it's all basically the important event that happened in the history that changed the course of history mm -hmm. so uh, it uh, it is one of the way we look at or we can understand the history and also uh, Uh, how we can reimagine the future, and uh, probably even how we can even change the future. So there are all kind of possibilities are there. Without understanding history, we cannot change the future. That is uh, one of the very basic fundamental philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. So Santosh, um, as we are really um, kind of running out of time. Yeah. Uh, i would like to go right into the last series of watercolors uh, watercolor paintings that uh, you know are almost a new direction within your practice uh, and you've been doing this for the past few years and uh, while you know the visual vocabulary kind of situates itself within the lineage of historical portrait paintings uh, the tropes that you use such as the man with the crutch or sling or the wheelchair or the count up clock they create this completely jarring juxtaposition of history and contemporaneity so maybe while i run through the images you can talk a little about it and also about the abundance of the floral motifs and after that we can start taking a few questions uh can i can talk about this work from various point of view it may take a long time the uh, the fundamental level actually this a uh, kind of watercolor as i started probably since so seven years ago uh till then i was doing very small scale watercolor uh this probably this series of works i started with uh, one of the show that was conceived by uh, by jim park and shalini was there in uh, gilgarry so that show was 
about graphics. I had uh, the show one could uh, do or follow the kind of methodology of uh, making graphic script, uh, space uh, using spray guns and those kind of methods and materials, normally the kind of graphic is followed. But since it was a gallery space, I thought, uh, uh, you know, why don't I focus on the idea of what does the graffiti do? And what is the fundamental purpose of making that? So, thinking that, I thought that probably I can think about uh, uh, the idea of communication. So, I thought that the element of uh, political postures can be, or the kind of format of political postures can be. Kind of an interesting idea to be adopted into the world. So initially, I started making a set of posters using a number of, you know, kind of postings, as I mentioned before, kind of external posting which you can put on at any point. You, you are talking about this, right? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah. This and this, yeah. yeah this, Kind of person you can keep on asking for the time, still it will be relevant. Mm -hmm. So, this was done very consciously uh, taking influence from the kind of political poster making. Mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, referred to so many in the Russian communist era propaganda posters and things like that. But uh, here in this kind of work, there are text, and uh, which uh, text of course is kind of central image. Uh, where this central image seems to have like, a, some kind of a, a performative element. Right. And which I used to do the photography in my studio, mm -hmm. arranging and uh, making a model of somebody who enact the kind of a story. Uh, so this was a kind of a going back in time again, you know, like uh, in my sculpture again. It uh, took me almost 20, 25 years back in time. And I was remembering what all those time when I used to paint a lot of uh, political posters. Mm. And in the middle of night, going around the city and pasting them all around. So all those experiences actually brought me back. And, uh, I thought probably I can rework on them in a completely totally different uh, linguistic uh, system. And, uh, uh, even I had experiences of having or doing the street theater where I had mm -hmm. acted in many street uh, projects, the theater projects at that time. So all those memories probably I can trace through this project. Because in the, one of the, these works have a different uh, layers of meaning. On a fundamental level, the two important layers is that the central image and the background. Yeah. So the central the, image, yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, you know, I was uh, reading up about when you told that all the flowers that you've used, they're almost like a garden, a medicinal garden, because all of them can be uh, used to treat some disease or the other. So, uh, you know, so some of the, uh, you have used Rangon, what we call Rangon in Bangla. Uh, so there are some images and which is Ikshora uh, in uh, English. It has a very interesting history that in ancient Tamil literature, there's a mention of the flower being given, worn by soldiers when going into battle. So I found these kind of, uh, you know, intriguing ideas of usage of uh, flora and fauna within uh, with uh, again juxtaposed yeah. with violent images of violence and death and 
war and and rather the results of war because your um, protagonist sometimes have crutches or are on wheelchair so you're kind of i think talking about the ravages of war and the healing process needed yeah this that is exactly i was talking it has for two uh, fundamental layers on the one hand it's the central image of the protagonist and the background mm-hmm. in which the whole thing is happening so i imagine this as a kind of a one act play where the protagonist will be you know through the help of having so many props try to you know kind of uh, unfold the story so what is happening around there are very each image seems to have a metaphorical yeah. connection with what is happening in you know, the rats in the prosthetics rat traps in the crutches and all that even the child the kind of toy child you know, laying on the ground all those things have a very direct or indirect connection with what what we are doing this political scenario So talking about yeah yeah I'm really I'm keep <laughs> interrupting you but uh, we really have to go into question and answers now yeah, I've sure, sure. got a lot of questions but before that uh, you know I know that you you work very slowly and these are uh, quite large watercolors uh, so just before we go into the questions by uh, yeah by our viewers I would like to ask how long does it take for you to do one of these large works and do you work in layers or is it uh, like your paintings i've seen you doing your oils where you start from a corner and kind of uh, work through the process so is that a similar kind of a process here as well yeah this watercolors are basically done in one layer i don't do much of uh, uh, layering Right. only if it is necessary then there is uh, 99% of this watercolor that i have in this uh, one layer mm-hmm. but from the color coating that i have in the second like this red one mm-hmm. so the brown is the so uh, it takes a long time because there are a lot of details in it, especially because of the uh, background and the intricate uh, details of all those images is the but it will take the minimum of uh, 25 to 30 days to complete the other things is extra in the sense of making taking photograph and uh, arranging the images so extra right uh so maybe we'll start taking questions uh some okay. questions have we've received some questions from our um, you know facebook viewers so one of them i think i'll just stop sharing uh before i stop sharing uh viewers please do share your feedback on contact at imamiart.com and follow the imami art facebook and instagram pages thank you um So Sanjeev Son Pimpre, who's a mutual friend, he's asking why posing questions, critiquing through work, be pointed as pessimistic view. I think T V Santosh's view and choice of using certain language and concerns are perfectly and powerfully relevant in a meaningful way. Sanjeev, I don't disagree at all. It is a Santosh himself who has used the word pessimistic about his uh, practice many times. um so i was just quoting him and if santosh would like to make an observation thank you sanjeev <laughs> nice to hear from you uh, today because it's not a question i think it's a statement yeah, it's, a uh, yeah, it's an observation yeah. um so uh Pra- prakar tripathi from again on facebook asks why the dip- no no sorry sorry this is not uh, today's question uh, let me ask questions from here um just a second okay we have a lot of questions here shanti kashi asks do you make sketches first how are the colors decided in the watercolor especially the yellow background 
Yeah, actually, uh, as I said before, that uh, I had taken kind of uh, elements from the political poster making, especially again the Russian propaganda posters. So they used to make a very flat uh, background, maybe red, yellow, white, and yellow. So that is one of the reasons I started using the yellows to make it look like the poster, even though, you know, it uh, just uh, went beyond that. So that is uh, one reason, but there are other technical reasons. Sujata Singh asks, does he, ca uh, I mean, do you carve the wood yourself or collaborate with craftsmen in your sculptures? Uh, in the woodwork, I collaborate with the craftsmen. I have employed uh, people from Rajasthan who do that uh, carving. But the rest of the sculptures, most of the works were done in the studio. And whatever uh, the fiberglass works we have actually from the very beginning to the last time uh, uh, have been involved with but wood carving. But even in the case of wood carving, there are in every stage there is uh, uh, you have to decide what to do from the very beginning of the, the pre idea. So it's almost like a, a very, a process of very close to the kind of uh, architecture where the architect is So Mautushi Chakraborty asks, so she's asked two questions, so let me just punch them. She asks, who are your protagonists in uh, Justice 4 and why monochrome color for the protagonists? Um, well, as I said uh, before, that it's a kind of a, kind of a language of posters that initially I start exploring. So that uh, then with minimum number of color to have maximum impact, that is you know, kind of the criteria to have the more interested or to communicate the idea. With the minimum, you know, uh, uh, effort to maximum level, that was not the aspect of it. But if you are going into color, then you have to think about uh, what does that color represent, the possibility, of, uh, and also you have to even go think about multi-layer system. You know? Here with the since one color, one monochromatic color, you don't have to think about multi-layer system of it. Mm -hmm. So that was one taken technical reason. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily conceptual issue. Mm -hmm. So it's, this is very interesting. There are two uh, different uh, two similar questions from two different people, and both are Aditi's. One is Aditi Raman and one is Aditi Babel. And they both ask about the text and numbers that you've used in uh, your sculptures. But I think we have covered that a bit. So perhaps uh, you have received your reply or answer uh, while we were discussing the works. Um, Santo, uh, Vijay Raghavan Srinivasan asks, how important are titles in your paintings and what does truthfulness of reality mean to you? And he also says you are one of his favorite artists. Thank you. Uh, yeah, titles are very important. Title can work in various levels. Uh, Ushmeda, it's, are you listening? It is stuck, I think. Hello. Uh, I, 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 Line has gotten hung. I think uh, Ushmita's uh, connection is oh, lost. But we can so, hear uh, me. We'll just wait for yes, her to yes, connect yes. back. Yeah. But you can hear me, no? so I can uh, yes. continue with the answer. Yes, yes, yes. 
So uh, I had mentioned initially that uh, very rarely I had even started with the, the title rather than the image. But most of the time I title the work uh, once the work is completed. So title also sometimes is very much uh, integral part of the work and it's uh, meaning making in the sense that uh, sometimes, uh, you know, title gives you a kind of a way of looking into the painting or some kind of opening into the painting, the possibility of opening into the painting. That is the way I see the titles. Mm -hmm. can, one can see titles as uh, uh, something that just to you know, differentiate one painting from other or something that uh, you know, generate a certain kind of meaning more than what image talk about. Or something like a threshold. It can work as a threshold through which you can enter into the painting, enter into the meaning of the painting. So many levels one can see the possibility of using the title. So in my case, titles are rather the kind of extension of my work. Because certain ideas which are not really possible to decipher by simply looking at the image, the title probably will give you some kind of an idea or some kind of glimpses of the meaning behind those images. So I mean, uh, it can directly connect with the kind of context in which I am working. That is the kind of thing. Hello. Anybody hear me? I don't know. Yeah. I, I think uh, Ushmita, Ushmita is uh, still facing some problems. Um, so, sir, if you would like to add anything else. Uh, yeah, Ushmita came. She came. I think, it's I think she's joined back. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know. Uh, the Neither my modem was working and my broadband went off. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, have all the questions been addressed or are there still some more questions? Shreyasi, did you take over? No, I didn't take any questions. I, uh, uh, so I was continuing with his previous question. So I think you can... Uh, I can't see any questions anymore because I've logged in. Okay, I'll just send you the questions. Okay, there's one question. Meanwhile, somebody's written. Your paintings are almost colorful and sculptures are close to monotonous. Do you ever imagine sculptures in these vibrant colors? Uh, actually, in fact, uh, the kind of works I had done during my BFA time, Shandini Gedi, they were all very colorful works. In the same, they were all painted with colors. Yeah. So, uh, I don't have any images of that. We had some photographs of that, but uh, right now I don't know where are they. <laughs> so I don't have any documents. So, uh, but then, yeah. yeah. No, sorry, sorry, please continue. I keep. No, no, you tell me. Um, some, uh, so, one last question, maybe we yeah. can. Um, would you like to share a little about what you are working on right now? This is from Shanti Kashi. Uh, right now, it's very difficult to say. It's, uh, the last two, three months, I have not done anything because of uh, this corona situation. And now, a couple of weeks back, I started coming back to my studio. And a couple of works I had left and finished. So I am trying to complete the studio. So it's a, sort of a continuation of whatever we have been doing with the watercolors that you have already seen. Uh, Imageries are similar, 
certain differences with the issues the mandates um, yeah so i think we are right out of time and uh, unfortunately we'll have to end the session now uh, thank you so much uh, santosh uh, richa are you there or uh, i'm there but my net is uh, kind of uh, being very poor on me today so uh, even uh, i was locked out for a few minutes um, exactly so, so i'm just going to take a chance so yes it's been a very interesting question and my uh, interesting session and my last question question is what you took uh what is it that we are working on now and what was interesting another i don't know if we covered if i missed but uh, what is it that really drives you to choose a medium that you want to work on uh that's a very interesting question but uh, difficult to answer <laughs> uh something that you do in oil color may not be uh, interesting to do in water too because each medium demands something each medium seems to have its own possibilities so something you do in sculpture may not be able to do it in paint i never try to replicate what i do in paint in sculpture you know or vice versa what were i did in sculpture i never try to replicate in paint because i realized that that is a kind of a very problematic uh, linguistic practice uh, maybe there are people who have done it very successfully in most cases not very successful but in my case it doesn't somehow work because whenever i uh, work with the medium then i think about the possibility of the medium what you can do and how you can extend the uh, the idea with the help of uh, using a different material so it automatically become for far away removed from the painting or far away removed from sculpture so every time you do something you have to do that very fresh it's a very challenging thing actually uh, so i apologize to everybody whose questions we could not attend to one because uh, uh, of the limitations of time and second because i was logged out and i seem to have lost all the questions that you had sent um i <laughs> but it's a uh, it's been a wonderful session looking at santosh's practice and uh, listening to his experience and his ideas and concepts uh, please do join in to get tomorrow at the same time 4 o'clock when uh, we'll be speaking with anju dodia and i also request everybody once again to send in your feedback at contact@imamiart.com and also join uh the imami art facebook and instagram pages for uh future uh, updates on all programs um richa over to you and thank you so okay. much yeah. thank you so much thank you so much yeah yeah thank you rich and uh, mushmida for I inviting me for the hope to do this session <laughs> i don't know whether i spoke well or not but oh fantastic oh, <laughs> you i mean <laughs> always wonderful I I just uh, you know these kind of conversations uh, feel like it can go on for yeah, hours yeah. definitely uh, and that's I yes. think what we did in Shantini Ketan we yeah. both kept on speaking I don't know for how many hours about the, someone who's written on the chat you are the best okay <laughs> you're best thank you for your written thank this uh Vinay uh, Nair has Ah, we need help. I need. Thank you. Thank you. Sabita, it's been wonderful presentation. Yeah. So, yes, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have Thank a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.